Well, I wanted to start by thanking you for the very kind invitation. I was asked today to talk a little bit about the journey of a company we now call Verily, and also a little bit about my own journey. So I, I thank you for your, your attention. As you heard today, we're going to be talking about data and the concept of data. And, and I'm prefacing this around this convergence of how do we deal with data technology and healthcare broadly. I want to start with the premise that I think almost everyone in the room believes that the convergence of technology and healthcare ultimately can lead to healthier and hopefully happier lives. And again, this isn't something new to any of you here. It's certainly not new to me as a cardiologist. Uh, many of my colleagues remind me that we've been using stethoscopes for over two centuries. Uh, that is the technology. Uh, when you take care of any cardiac patient, uh, especially those who go on to need surgery or cardiac catheterization, we use cardiac imaging. So technology abounds and is everywhere in the work that we do. But I think everything from the conference today would suggest that we're reaching a time right now where technology is really exploding. And it's not only exploding in the healthcare space, but it's in other spaces where we're going to start leveraging those technologies and placing it firmly in the hands of patients, providers, and healthcare systems. And it was very evident to me when I got a call from, uh, at the time it was Google X. Uh, as I mentioned, I was a cardiologist, or am a cardiologist, and I got a call from Google X. I said, oh, they must have the wrong, the wrong person on the phone. Uh, I'm not a technologist. But they said, please come out, come out and visit and, and see what we're doing here. And at the time, Google X uh, was housing several key projects. Google X is the research and development arm of Google. And what we had are people working on the driverless car, sitting next to people working on new ways of understanding uh, energy, new ways of understanding access, and then healthcare. And at first, you might think that these are very disparate types of groups, very disparate types of organizations. Uh, while I drove a car and drive a car, I, I certainly was not an autonomous vehicle expert. But what I learned very quickly is the same problems that people were dealing with in that space were quite similar to what we're approaching in healthcare. So if you think about the car, the car has to integrate a map system uh, that actually changes. Uh, I know now being uh, in London last night, uh, trying to get to, uh, to this location, we, uh, we had our own set of challenges, but I did make it here, um, <laughs> th thanks to the, to the map system. Uh, so there's maps that you have to integrate. A car has to have a sensor on the top to understand all of the other cars that are going on. A car also has to understand whether there's going to be a pothole. What happens if a chicken crosses the road? These are all different inputs that the car has to integrate. So this is a big data problem, much in the same way that healthcare, in many cases, can be a big data problem. So as it turns out, our, our relatively small health group ended up getting uh, bigger because, again, as people in the room know, there is a lot of information in healthcare. And we ended up becoming our own branch, and we're called Verily, and we're the group within Alphabet uh, and the Google family focused solely on life science and healthcare. And in a very short period of time, this has been uh, quite an adventure. So what, what do we actually do? I was asked to really boil this down into some key themes. And these are themes that I see not only in the work that we're doing, but in the work that we're talking today about broadly. We're thinking about new ways of collecting information, and I'm going to talk more about that and why we need to not only be content with the information we have today, but why we have to keep pushing the boundaries. We're thinking about ways to organize information. This is incredibly important. I'll tell you a little bit about my, my own story in the past and how I've gotten very excited about new ways of organizing information. And I think the most important thing is actually activating this information and making it useful. We can sit around and come up with the world's best widgets, and we can spend all day uh, talking about deep neural nets. But unless we make this information useful, it won't have the impact that we all want to have. So I think this is an area that I hope all of us continue to focus on. So collecting information. There's a lot of information in the healthcare space. We have medical records, images, the genome, the microbiome, proteomics, metabolomics, and now we have a lot of traditional wearables and devices. So this idea of collecting information, the information is out there, but it will be changing, and I think that's going to be the key piece to focus on. And I want to start with an example uh, of diabetes. And the reason I use diabetes is not because uh, it's the most complicated disease to talk about, but it's because it's one that has a, a relatively reasonable readout that we all agree clinically is, is useful. 
And so we know that patients need to measure their blood glucose. And what I'm showing you here in, in the middle is a standard representation of a patient who's writing down their blood glucose levels. Uh, if you notice this particular example, it looks like there might be a coffee stain on it. Uh, I remember having one patient when I came into one of my clinics who uh, was sitting in there and I saw him writing the values down in the book because he wanted to please, uh, please me, his practitioner. So uh, this is what we ask patients to do. Uh, I also include a picture of a composition notebook because I want to introduce you to the story of my grandfather. Now, my grandfather, uh, in contrast to this patient with the, uh, the coffee stains, uh, was a very, very diligent person and patient. And he would check his blood glucose four times a day, and he would take out his composition notebook, and he'd write down the values. And we had stacks of these notebooks in our house. And this was before the time where I had gone to medical school. And I thought, my goodness, my grandfather has diabetes, and he spends all of his time uh, with this particular condition, but he's only going to see the physician for a handful of minutes. And I thought, oh, I have a great idea. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go and average all those values. I'm going to take the 40s and the 230s. And as it turns out, his blood glucose looked pretty good when I did that. I now realize on the other end that that's an absolutely wrong way of collecting and organizing that information. But I knew that a provider would never be able to use it. And I think my grandfather, if he were alive today, would be very happy to know that we wouldn't have to go through that exercise, that actually we now have devices that are connected. They're connected to people's smartphones, and they can be displayed uh, anywhere you want. So there are ways to get around this. And I think he'd be really interested in even new, the next generation of connected devices. And I'm showing you an example that I'm particularly familiar with because it's something that the group at Verily and what we've been working on. And you look here in the far left side of the slide, and what I'm showing you is a prototype of a glucose sensing contact lens. And what the group set out to do and what we were interested in, in thinking about ways of instrumenting things that people use every day, contact lenses, for example. And could we, in that contact lens, put an incredibly small integrated circuit, a way of communicating the information, and a sensor? And what was interesting from this task is not only the work that's being done on the contact lens in partnership with Alcon, but the fact that this challenge got a group of us to create incredibly small biocompatible electronics. It was the same type of technology that we've been able to leverage and now create what is going to be the world's smallest continuous glucose monitor that I'm showing you here on the left. And later today, you're going to hear from Chris Pham, who's going to be talking about electroceuticals. So this idea of not only using sensors to get information, but maybe we can create incredibly small electronics to actually treat different conditions, and he'll tell you more about it. But this idea of new connected devices brings up this, this notion. Uh, we heard earlier someone was talking about being a, a dreamer. But I think we have to start thinking not only about the signals we can capture today, but what signals should we be capturing broadly. And this brings me to the point that while there are some near-term solutions, many of which we're talking about today, there's going to be a next generation of different signals. So I'm showing you on the slide a spoon that measures a tremor. One could argue that might be a better metric than me seeing a patient a few times a year and trying to determine whether their tremor is getting better or worse with a given medication. And again, these are the types of things that we're going to have to test. But not only are these signals going to be traditional signals, biologic signals, digital readouts, but we now have voice signals that we can start to pay attention to. And certainly in the realm of mental health, people talk about changes in voice cadence, talk about changes in frequency, who the people are actually contacting. And if we start harnessing this information in a safe, secure, and private way, the hope is that we'll do a much better job of truly understanding what makes your disease different from someone else. And as we talked about in the morning session, how do we actually tailor therapies? So these are, these are the general ideas and the general concepts that now being uh, firmly implanted in a tech company, I, I'm starting to, to pay attention to and to appreciate. But you can collect uh, all the information you want uh, as you saw with my grandfather, but unless we come up with new tools to organize it, we haven't made that next hurdle. And so how are we thinking about organizing data? And, and this is where I'll, 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 I promised I told, would tell you a story about my prior life. So uh, I was a practicing and am a practicing cardiologist. I also spent a fair amount of my professional career running large-scale clinical trials. And what we were looking for is new therapies to treat patients with heart attacks. 
And I became particularly interested in why patients with particular genetic variants may respond differently to therapies. Now at the time, uh, this was several years ago when we were really hit hitting our stride and uh, we were taking up a lot of physical <laughs> server space. And at the time, uh, people were really interested in where you compute. And I got a call from our IT department and they said, you're taking up way too much server space, you need to figure, you need to figure out a solution. And I thought, but I'm talking to IT. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and I'm a cardiologist. But that, that was okay, that was okay. I was up for the challenge, we worked together, and this was before cloud computing was, was really well established. And uh, that was actually one of the reasons I started to talk to Google, I talked to many of the providers, but really trying to figure out not where we compute, but how we compute. And as we move forward and we have more ready access to cloud computing, the data that you're working on can be shared with data that you're working on. And we spent a lot of time this morning talking about how genomics work can scale when we use these kinds of, uh, kinds of tools. And I personally have found it incredibly gratifying to see this transformation so that we can now actually start to think about the problems that we're solving. Now, I would be remiss if I showed a lot of glossy slides and just said, oh, it's incredibly easy, we can take your genomes and your genomes and, and, and we can put them in a black box and we can shake them up and create magic uh, because it, it, it actually doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Uh, there's a lot of work being done and there's a lot of work that we've been doing and others trying to create the right infrastructure. I don't uh, mean for the people in the back of the room to see every, uh, every detail on the slide, but just to start to say we have to figure out how to get many different types of multidimensional data ingested. We have to have consensus around curated data repositories, data schema are a really interesting and complicated uh, way of thinking about problems, and then how do we actually display this information, going back to that concept of patients, providers, and users. But again, I just wanted to plant the seed that the, this work is being done, uh, but it, it's, not, um, it's not as glossy as it always seems. But if we start to do that right, and we start to have access to this meaningful data, and we ask clinically meaningful questions, we are going to be able to use tools that are being developed broadly across the field of technology. And we've already heard today talk of this deep learning revolution. And, and I always find it interesting uh, to figure out why, why, why is that the case? And uh, I, I sometimes like to ask, are, are, is, I'm showing a picture of a cat. Uh, do we have any, anyone who owns a cat? Okay, a few people, few people own a cat. Uh, has anyone ever taken a picture or a video of your cat? Yeah, a lot of people. People like taking pictures of their cats, as it turns out. Uh, <laughs> Nothing's wrong with that. Um, please forward your cat pictures. But what was interesting is as I started to talk to some of my colleagues that were working on image processing and image resolution, and now you know that within a lot of these tools, it will sort the different images. And so you may take something like a cat, and now that we have this layered network architecture, we can actually get down uh, to this idea that, that, that computers can recognize this image as being a cat. And the reason I'm so happy about this, uh, I, while I'm very supportive of all the cat lovers out there, I'm also really happy because the same tools and technologies can start to be applied to medical, medical work, medical uh, images, many of the types of data that we're gonna start to collect. And so as we transition and we think about this picture of the cat, I'm now gonna show you pictures of something that, again, is near and dear to patients who have diabetes. And so if we go back to the story I was telling you about my grandfather, this is a picture of, of fundus images. And if you look on the far left of the slide, what you'll see is a patient with no diabetic retinopathy. On the right-hand side is someone with diabetic retinopathy. Normally, many of these images are read manually by ophthalmologists or optometrists. Now, while there's nothing wrong with that, it takes time, and it certainly keeps people away from seeing their patients. And so we did proceed to look to see whether these same neural networks that I showed you earlier that were working on other images, could they be applied to diabetic retinopathy? And what we, we learned is that deep learning algorithms had very high sensitivity and specificity for detecting diabetic retinopathy, which is one of the leading causes of blindness. So this is just an early demonstration of how these tools are going to be used. And they can be used on many different data sets. Uh, there are some nuances. As I said, it's not the box that you shake up. But I do think we're going to start to see more and more applications. So now that we get towards uh, the end of the talk, and, and I told you this is the part that I think is most important. You can collect, you can organize, but you really have to activate information. And for me, what has been incredibly eye-opening, as someone who spent a lot of my career in the four walls of a hospital, is really to start to think about all of the patients as, as who they fundamentally are, who they are as people, and how we can actually bring the right therapies and, and bring tools that, that people actually, actually want to use. 
And I want to go back to my grandfather. So he's in the middle of the slide. And he was being asked to do a lot of things. He was being asked to take his blood glucose. He needed to see his primary care provider. He needed his annual eye exam that I showed you images of earlier. He needed to see specialists. He needed to dose his insulin. He had oral medications. Oh, and by the way, if he could be healthy, exercise, and get your feet checked. These are many, many things that, as a provider, I'm asking someone to do. Um, that, as a provider, my, my grandfather uh, had people asking him to do. And we've got to start thinking about this a bit differently. We really do have to think about how do we create solutions and design with the user in mind. And this is something that, that many industries have thought about. And I, I don't want to say that we haven't done it in healthcare. I think we've done amazing things. And, and I'm someone here to say, for those of you who are uh, clinicians or healthcare providers, I think there's always going to be a role uh, for the work we do. But at the same time, there is this idea of trying to really capture what is valuable to an individual and how can we create that. And one example that we've been working on is really thinking about a platform of how do we think about patients with diabetes, and again, I'm, I'm sticking with this example, but what kind of tools do they actually want? And maybe the tools that you want are different than the tools that someone else wants. And how do we really motivate people and think about the behavioral science that underlies all of this with this idea of trying to improve outcomes? And one thing that would be different from, I think, a lot of other technologies, it may not be how much time or how much engagement someone has with this. In fact, what we hope is that we create tools that keep people more seamless in their life. Maybe they can go on quickly, get all the information they need. And so I think that's where we're going to see some of these technologies in healthcare diverge from other technologies in other spaces. But my belief is that if we do this right, we can actually collect information, organize it, and activate it to make sure that people have healthier lives. And that's why when people ask me, so what's a cardiologist doing, uh, doing at a tech company? Well, I think we have a responsibility. I think we have a responsibility to work side by side um, with many of you, as I mentioned in the room, who are technologists and engineers. But we need to have a seat at the table so that we come up with solutions that we think are truly going to benefit society. So I thank you for your attention, and thank you very much for the invitation. Jessica, thank you. <laughs>